Indonesian films. Today's talk is sponsored by the Department of English and along with the Department of Literature. Before giving uh, the introduction duty to, to my colleague, Odo Nilsson, I'd like to, to mention a couple of events uh, this week and next week. First, next week speaker for the luncheon would be Andrew Singer at Penn State, and uh, he will be speaking on Derek Walcott and expansions of English language poetry. And uh, also, as you may know, um, Andrew Singer is a director of Traffic Fuel. And there is a, a marvelous poet Poetry reading at Webster uh, Bookstore Cafe on Wednesday, October 4th at 7 p.m. Also, the Center for Global Studies um, present New Media in India. This will be held on October 5th, Thursday, Poster Auditorium at 1 through 2 30 p.m. So please join and I will pass around the fire. And now I will I'll pass the introductory duty to uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be missing uh, next week, but I was thinking about Derek Walcott when I woke up to the horrifying news this morning. There's a powerful line in Walcott where he says, the classics can console, but not enough. Um, so we have the author of From Outlaw 2 Classic with us today. <laughs> Some years ago, Alan Golding had the duty of introducing the film scholar David James as a keynoter at what you, the conference formerly known as the 20th Century Literature Conference. Hmm. And um, he didn't start in the usual place. Most people introducing David would mention how he began his life as a British romanticist teaching at Occidental College and had in his creative writing class a promising young man named Gary Obama. Uh, but that's not where Alan started. Instead, he asked the audience to um, imagine an English lad, as he put it, educated beyond his class, who then lands in the United States of America right in the middle of one of our periodic spasms of rock and roll revolution and creativity. <clears throat> Most of us sitting in the room realized that this was not only a description of the life of David James, but it was essentially the autobiography of Alan Golding, uh, educated at Exeter and then the University of Chicago, part of that remarkable group of students who went through the graduate seminars of uh, uh, Robert von Hallberg and have spread out to spread the poisonous poetry virus everywhere in the world. Um, he taught before landing at Louisville at uh, Los Angeles and Oxford, Mississippi. But most of us have come to know Alan through his uh, work during the time he's been at the University of Louisville, where he's now the director of the conference, now called the Louisville Conference on Literature and Culture since 1900. But the reason all of you should know uh, Alan, actually you should, you should all submit papers and go to that conference, but the reason all of you should know Alan is that most of us recognize him as one of the central uh, scholars of modern and contemporary American poetry and poetics. He's one of the founding editors of the University of Iowa's uh, crucial series in uh, North American Poetry and Poetics. And he's the author of this book, From Outlaw to Classic, Canons in American Poetry, which is one of the most essential volumes, appears on comp lists all over the world. Um, and if you thumb through this book, you will come to the familiar name of one Mr. Professor Patti, who in addition to contributing an ungrammatical line to the school's alma mater, of course, is one of three people who purported to be the first American professor of American literature. Uh, even Petit finds his way into from that lot of classic. I'm not sure which category he falls into, the outlaw category or classic category. Uh, but Alan has continued this work uh, over the years, doing some really exciting presentations that I've uh, had the honor of hearing on uh, avant-garde poetry and pedagogy, for example. So please welcome Alan Moore. They're going to hook him up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, I'm very old school. I have a hand though. <laughs> um, there are 45 here, so uh, you all can do the math and decide if you need to share or you can take one for yourself. Sound here, is Avant-Gardeism Against Itself, Conversation and the Reader Critic in the Little Review. Um, the, the kind of the subtext is the title of a, a talk by the contemporary poet David Anton, um, what it means to be avant-garde. The idea of what it means to be avant-garde is going to come in and out of the talk at, uh, at various points. A lot of you, I imagine, are uh, somewhat familiar with the modernist uh, little magazine, the little review. Um, for those of you who are not, um, a quick thumbnail introduction. Uh, the little review is often thought of as one of the quintessential modernist little magazines. It was founded in 1914. Um, by Margaret Anderson in Chicago. She was the initial editor. Um, it was edited from 1916 to 1923 by Anderson and her partner, Jane Heap, um, during which time it moved from Chicago briefly to San Francisco and then um, to New York in about 1917. Um, Jane Heap stepped away from the magazine in 1923. Her partner, Heap, uh, excuse me, Margaret Anderson, stepped away from the magazine in 1923. Her partner, uh, Jane Heap, continued to edit it uh, through 1929, though the last substantive issue is actually 1926, and then there was a three year gap, and they did a kind of final retrospective um, issue. And that was it. Um, the other major name associated with the magazine um, that you'll hear in this talk is that of Ezra Pound, who was a, uh, served as the very controversial foreign editor for the journal during the years 1917 to 1990. So that's a quick kind of um, location for for the magazine. And I'm going to set my uh, cell phone timer to try and keep myself on track in terms of time. So at some point you're going to hear a, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> a little blues riff coming out of the blue. So, among little magazines, the Little Review has always been particularly associated with the promotion of experimental modernism. With its epigraph making no compromise with the public taste, often taken as a synecdoche for the magazine's iconic avant-garde status, and its relationship to a wider audience. The reality, however, is rather messier, especially in the magazine's early years, and complicates our received associations of avant-garde thinking with models of aesthetic and historical rupture. 
Highly self-reflexive in its sense of itself as the cutting edge of the cutting edge, the Little Review staked out a position in its spring 1922 issue in capital letters as, quote, an advancing point toward which the advance guard is always advancing. <laughs> Despite such energetic claims, however, this avant-garde magazine that, for instance, consistently made fun of futurism, did not unreflectively accept that nothing is good save the new, in that well-known phrase of William Carlos Williams that appeared in his pages in 1919. The notion of the Little Review as an unambiguous proponent of modernist experiment is complicated by close scrutiny of the magazine's issue-by-issue -issue publication history, which reveals emerging experiment in conversation, one of Margaret Anderson's models for her editing, with a range of far more traditional and even conservative literary practices and attitudes, especially in the magazine's early years. At stake here is not simply a richer understanding of how the Little Review's avant-gardism developed in dialogue with much, much more mainstream writing within the magazine's own pages. Also at stake is an ongoing methodological reconsideration of our approaches to modernist little magazines more generally. While Ezra Pound saw his choices as contending in his words, either with lunacy of the Little Review or stodge of the dial, Pondering what it meant to be avant-garde in the Little Review involves our considering the relationship between lunacy and stodge within the Little Review itself. The other to the Little Review's undoubted avant-gardism existed not outside the magazine, but inside and in conversation with it. Especially, it existed in the reader critic section, an easily overlooked component of the magazine that published correspondence from readers acting, as you can infer from the title, as critics. It's in the reader critic that the Little Review's dialogic relationship to its own avant-garde stance shows up most notably in the magazine's incorporation of critique from some of its own regular contributors and from readers of the very literary and art movements, imagism, free verse, dada, surrealism, and individuals, Pound or the Baroness Elsa von Freytag Loringhoven, that it promoted. So, I want to consider the Little Review as a magazine in persistent dialogue with itself and with avant-garde notions of radical change via its editorial engagement with conflicting viewpoints in its reader-critic section and its self-reflexive editorial commentary. If modernist magazines' studies has taught us two things, they are to take as a fundamental premise of the field the dialogic nature of modernism as it emerges in magazines and to attend to paratexts. I've used the term dialogic in my own earlier work on the relationship between the dial and the little review, and at this point, it's part of the standard discourse of periodical studies. To take just one example, writing of the magazine Rhythm, Faith Binks notes, quote, the centrality of dialogue and debate, contingency and competition in the development of a modernism mediated through periodicals. Describing, to quote again, an avant-garde conditioned by the need to generate and secure cultural capital by particular and often competitive dialogues, by negotiation and engagement, as much as revolution and rupture. As magazine studies becomes increasingly digitized, one useful approach to the conversation that was modernism, especially given its scale and complexity, involves versions of Franco Moretti's distant reading. For example, Jeff Druin, has performed a combination of network analysis and text mining to produce a bibliographic and thematic review of the September 1918 Little Review. It's a very particularized project. Sean Latham's work on the New Age would provide a similar, more broad-based example. At the same time, we also still need detailed textured accounts, thick descriptions, if you will, of particular aspects of this cultural conversation if we're to continue to understand better how it played out in practice. And that's part of what I'll gesture towards today. Elizabeth Francis observes that what was peripheral in most magazines was central to the form and structure of the Little Review, the editorials, announcements, and letters, and its reflections on its own status, problems, and triumphs. The reader critic is one site of that commentary, internal debate, and self-reflexiveness. In this comment, Francis advises 
to uh, treat that which appears paratextual then as something other than supplementary, a move, of course, that practitioners of modernist magazine studies are increasingly used to make it. We can think of the reader critic then not as a paratext, but as a department of the little review, fairly regular, carefully edited, and central to developing and articulating the magazine's version of modernism. There were 76 total issues of the Little Review over the 15-year life of the publication, and 60 of those feature the reader critic. The department first appears in September 1914 and establishes the model of conversation, or at least internal difference, early. In this first manifestation, four correspondents praise the magazine. One writes in to find it exuberantly uncritical and merely enthusiastic. <laughs> a judgment that, interestingly, Anderson herself would come to agree with in later years. A local Chicago reader, quote, has the honor of sending in the first cancellation. <laughs> reader Margaret Pixley of Indianapolis, Anderson's hometown, critiques an article on parenthood in a way that Anderson responds to as typical of the older generation's response to the new order. And there follows a 10-paragraph critique from an anonymous boy reader Quote, which ought to throw some light on the subject from the young generation's standard um, perspective. Excuse me. From the beginning, then, the reader critic reflects the little review's willingness to display strong differences of opinion in conjunction with an emphasis on generational difference that has coded into it support of the modernist new and, as Mark Morrison has argued, a cultural and political investment in the idea of youth. Especially in the early years, the reader critic goes well beyond, though it also includes, the traditional functions of a correspondence section. Many of the reader letters function as further essays on issues raised in the magazine. In January 1915, for instance, reader SHG not only registers an opinion, I dislike very much your article on Emma Goldman, <laughs> but seriously thinks through the pros and cons of anarchism and is granted the space to do so. February 1915 brings a 14-paragraph letter essay from Rita Clinton Massick, himself a minor poet and educator and a contributor to poetry, in defense of free verse and the work of Maxwell Bodenheim, which had suffered heavy censure in a recent issue for its failure of understandable sense. Thus, Anderson constructs a space in which readers really can and do act as critics. Rita Virginia York, consistently no great friend of the magazine, offers a brutal critique of Arthur Davison Fick's poem, Café Sketches, as representative of the, quote, thick, black, dense seriousness of the little review's free verse. While the preferred counterexample that this reader cites, two metrically regular ranked quatrains by Harriet Howe, may be thoroughly conventional, it's notable that here a reader produces an almost Poundian exercise in practical criticism. Put two samples side by side and ask the reader to judge. While aesthetically, as distinct from politically, the Little Review did not begin as the vanguard outlet of many subsequent historians' construction. It was marked from the outset by a characteristically modernist rhetoric of newness and experiment, and the extent and effect of the magazine's revolutionary newness was openly debated among its readers within the reader critic department. In November 1914, responding to the Little Review's increasing anarchist commitments, a self-described proletarian is glad to see your magazine getting more and more revolutionary. And another reader praises your militant pen. But a third reader writes in from Paris that I fear you are getting too sane. So, not revolutionary enough, apparently, for that reader. Meanwhile, a long letter from a local reverend demands that you can discontinue sending your impertinent publication to my daughter. <laughs> what is the rhetorical function of publishing a rant like the reverend's? It's a pretty long rant. To score cheap satiric points at the Philistines' expense, building alternative cultural capital in the process, that's partly the point. But it also maintains the reader critic as another space in the magazine in which difference can circulate. Not limiting the reader critic to prose commentary, 
The editors not infrequently use satiric verse within the reader critic in typically dialogic fashion to reinforce from another angle the magazine's mission and ethos while teasing some of its own most regular and most self-consciously avant-gardist contributors. The following not exactly timeless quatrain closes the reader critic for September 1917 above the initials EJ. That is possibly Edgar Jepson who would contribute um, what became a very controversial critique of contemporary American poetry called the Western School one year later to the magazine. Um, this is the first passage on your handout. So, we close the reader critic in September 17 with this poem. Barry Bloody Bodenheim. Barry Bloody Bodenheim. Barry Bloody Bodenheim. And Johnny Rodker, too. <laughs> One of the most avid apologists for the Little Review's literary experimentation, Maxwell Bodenheim had already published 26 poems, three essays, including a previous reader critic contribution, and four co translations from the Chinese when this piece appeared. An English pound acolyte published extensively in The Egoist, John Rodker, had made his first appearances in the Little Review in the previous two issues, the July and August 1917, and went on to play a role as the magazine's foreign editor, Post Pound. In four lines, then, this reader critic squib eviscerates two substantial contributors to the Little Review project. Paradoxically, perhaps, deliberately minor poetry is also used in the reader critic to further the Little Review's brand of modernism and situate it in relation to other magazines, while again mocking one of the publication's most visible original contributors and supporters. The January 1918 Reader Critic kicks off with Abel Sanders' two-page parody of Vachel Lindsay's manner, Mr. Lindsay. <coughs> Splicing together rhythms, rhyme schemes, and images based on two of Lindsay's best known poems, General, General William Booth Enters Into Heaven and The Congo, published in poetry in 1913 and 1914, respectively. And this is the second passage on the handout. Just the first few lines of what was a two page exercise. Whoop golly, it's up, but bit. I'm Mr. Lindsay with the new sheep dip. I'm a loud voice yeller. I'm a prancing preacher. God's in his heaven. I'm the real high reacher. How facile are Lindsay's rollicking rhythms? Quote, time consumed in composition, 4 minutes, 31 seconds. <laughs> Try Sanders for celerity, reads the concluding quote. <laughs> the larger point, of course, has to do with Lindsay's status simultaneously as one of rival poetry magazine's poetic eminences, as one of the Little Review's earliest contributors and patrons, and as the core of a nativist poetic modernism, in opposition to which the Little Review, once established, set its more internationalist perspective. To publish this poem, then, is for the Little Review to use the reader critic in a debate with another magazine's competing version of modernism, and with its own earlier modernism. And the point is intensified when one learns that Abel Sanders is one of poetry's and the Little Review's primary correspondents, contributors, but also critics, Ezra Pound, writing under a pseudonym, which pounded a lot <coughs> in the Little Review and in other publications at the time. Far from being a neutral site for the exchange of ideas, You'll have inferred by now that the reader critic section is as edited, as constructed, as any other aspect of the magazine. A part of what is constructed in its pages is a particular relationship to audience, especially a bourgeois one. That relationship becomes increasingly aggressive as the magazine finds its legs. It's probably no coincidence that the tone of the reader critic section shifts noticeably in September 1916, the famous blank page issue, in conjunction with what was the Little Review's most avant-garde gesture so far. The projection of avant-garde negativity then becomes part of the, the uh, reader critic's cultural work. But the aggression was not all one way, it must be said. Next to those who wrote praising the magazine, correspondents consistently heaped moral and aesthetic outrage upon the editors. One regular correspondent, the playwright Alice Groff, begins one letter to Margaret Anderson with, 
I am going to tear to pieces your essay, A Real Magazine. The reader critic section is rhetorically constructed to stage the modernist culture wars with the alleged bourgeois philistinism and artistic conservatism against which the little review set itself being given a voice to which the editors increasingly talk back. Part of the conversation in the little review about audience involves not entirely baseless accusations from some readers about avant-garde posturing in the magazine. The extent to which we can distinguish posturing from performance, of course, is an entirely relevant question, not one I can spend time on here. One of the many functions of the reader critic is that it serves to boost the little review's self-construction as apologist for the artistically new and the politically radical. If moral and aesthetic objections to the magazine are often taken by the editors to be self-evidently absurd, one purpose of publishing those objections is to preach to the choir and assure it that it is doing its job. In other words, the reader critic invites dialogue while using it to further the magazine's ideals, ideals in conflict with those of mainstream readers whom it both mocked and yet somehow managed partly to retain and who energetically wrote back. In language suggesting that Muncie's term freak periodicals may have entered the popular discourse around magazines, one reader writes as follows in July 1918. No freak magazine can hold an audience long. It depends upon shock to taste and convention for its success, and it is always overdone. It shrieks. The defiance to Mrs. Grundy manifests itself in just coarseness or worse. It wearies the reader in a little while, for in spite of its professions, there is a note of insincerity in the whole performance that does not make for permanence. It is not the work of real people, only grinning masks and posturing mountebanks. Interestingly, this letter, unlike most such criticisms, is printed without editorial comment. A similar critique appears in the May-June 1920 issue, quote, the little review has become a disgustingly affected and artificial publication. You were like a crowd of precocious, smarty cat, overwise children showing off. <laughs> Such letter writers are responding to the coterie relationship to audience that the little review increasingly came to project. Quote, Why be so sure you and your group, small, select, and exotically interesting, are absolutely correct, as one correspondent puts it in 1918. In response to the complaint about James Joyce, in which this remark is embedded, Jane Heap, one of the co-editors, remember, asserts haughtily that the artist, and by implication the magazine, in a way consistent with its epigraph, quote, has no concern with audiences and their demands. As she and Anderson do in a number of places, Heap con consciously sets the little review against the democratic view of audience projected in Poetry Magazine's epigraph, Whitman's, to have great poets, there must be great audiences, too. She notes to her correspondent the Little Review's desire, quote, to remove from the mind of the reading public, Whitman's great audience, some of the superstition of its importance to the writer, some of the superstition of its being able to put any compulsion upon an artist. In the October 1918 reader critic, the audience, in a paragraph by that title, is projected as a parrot repetitively squawking cliches about the nature of art, but cliches that are not entirely dismissible. This is passage number four. Art should conceal art, said the parrot. Art is ennobling, said the parrot. Art is the ultimate combustion of the social consciousness of the proletariat into the fine flower of penultimate culture. It is the expression of the soul wave into the infinite of the ununderstandable je ne sais quoi said the parrot. <laughs> Damn the parrot. Damn the parrot. Although there is a faint dilutation of verity in each of these three remarks. An interesting final clause. In the next issue, in the first entry of the reader critic section, the audience there, again under the title, the audience, is figured in equally uncomplimentary fashion, passage number five, as a pig baffled by, quote, articulate speech by human beings, but annoyed by their failure to consider our capacity for comprehension. The insult is made even more personal by the special dedication to E. Hamilton of Chicago. This reader, some of whose language is actually appropriated in the parrot paragraph I quoted, 
had written a few issues earlier to complain of, quote, all the babbling about art and of the little reviews, quote, being inconsiderate of non-French speaking readers in publishing Ezra Pound's special issue, A Study of Modern French Poets. So, you know, you shouldn't have published Pound's special issue on modern French poets because you're, it's inconsiderate of people who don't read French, <laughs> is the argument there. Well, such um, editorial abuse of the audience um, in these kind of mocking uh, responses, uh, a deal breaker for readers, however. Apparently not always, to judge again from the reader critic. Otis A. Poole writes in October 1917, quote, Sometimes I think you needlessly alienate the support of numbers of subscribers possessed of rudimentary ambition towards a better appreciation of art in its various forms by too roughly snubbing and scoffing at them because they do not immediately swallow all the new stuff created in defiance of convention and precedent without a grimace of dislike. However, he concludes as follows. But the gods give me donkey wings if herewith is an extension of my subscription to the little review in spite of it. <laughs> the, little re the, uh, the reader critic's staging of its relationship to audience is sustained by frequent editorial claims to typicality. That is, time and again, Anderson and Heap respond to readerly critique with comments such as the one I cited earlier, where they characterize a letter as, quote, typical of the older generation's response to the new order. On the other hand, a letter from a young school-aged woman thanking the magazine for its socially uh, revolutionary positions is also typical of many that come in, in a more positive sense. In December 1915, a letter on, quote, what it means to be a real woman, to be an angel in the house, essentially, draws this weary head note from Margaret Anderson. Yes, this still happens. We get hordes <laughs> of such letters. <laughs> With this kind of framing, a typical letter offers, because of its alleged typicality, the opportunity for a mini manifesto or further statement of editorial purpose. The claim of typicality, that is, is used to represent the presumably widely held position from which the magazine differs and against which it carves out its own cultural space. The author's synecdochic use of correspondence extends into their response to a June 1918 read complaint about the Little Review's internationalism. Again, we hear, this is a very typical letter. It comes from all kinds of people, from men like the writer who is anxious about American art, and from the plain man cherishing his vices of provincialism. In this exchange, we see another crucial tension getting played out in the reader credit between the claims of a nativist and an internationalist modernism with which the little review was increasingly aligning itself. In March 1915, a regular early contributor, Will Levington Comfort, praises in the reader critic the magazine's uncovering of new voices and the new harmony, while celebrating in Whitmanesque rhetoric that it had to come from America. By September 1917, so two years later, however, one reader critic is complaining that, I wish you didn't have such a craze for foreigners and self-exiled Americans to which Jane Heap responds as part of a comment on American cultural belatedness that, I think there might be room in America for one magazine which will print work just because it is good, no matter where it is produced. <laughs> she restates his editorial stance um, in the June 1918 reader credit, answering criticism of the Little Review for, quote, laying too much stress on the foreign trademark. And yet, this is, an interesting seeming contradiction. The issue in which she says that, the June 1918 issue, was consciously an American number, titled as such, edited solely by Heap to a notably lukewarm response from her co-editor Anderson, and producing predictably opposing reader-critic responses from, the June number of the Little Review seems to be the best yet, and your American number is simply superb. All the way from that, to your American number is very nondescript. Mm -hmm. Cut out the American stuff, please. 
Not only does the magazine pull back occasionally then from the internationalist avant-garde commitment that was firmly established, but the reader critic department provides a strong sense of the passionately felt differences among its readers that might incline it to do so. Moving towards the wrap-up here. As Jonathan Eburn and Rita Falsky observe in the introduction to their 2010 co-edited special issue of New Literary History on the avant-garde, quote, narratives of the avant-garde abound. Whether they come to bury the avant-garde or to praise it, these narratives are typically organized around moments of shock, rupture, and youthful revolt that speak to certain beliefs about the functions of experimental art and the nature of historical change. A set of tropes that involve to quote again, overlooking the possibility of muted, qualified, deferred, or different transformations. While one would hardly describe the Little Review's voice in the conversation that was experimental modernism as muted, re-examining the magazine for its quotidian practices of internal debate, rather than its pre-canonical highlights, helps us to understand afresh the nature and dynamics of the aesthetic and political changes proposed by avant-garde work. In the spring 1925 issue of the Little Review, the correspondent to the reader critic contrasts the dial's carefulness. Um, those of you who don't know um, the field so much, the dial was a, a long-standing, um, much more mainstream, extremely well-funded, contemporary of the Little Review, um, with a much wider circulation that published a lot of the, um, the modernists who later came to be considered canonical, um, but tended to publish them after the Little Review, in many cases, had discovered them. Um, so there was always this argument between the two magazines with the Little Review taking the position that, well, you just publish the people we discover for you, and like, you're eternally late and kind of over careful. So, um, this correspondent contrasts the dial's carefulness, its concern not to be hoaxed or imposed upon, and its resultant tendency to quote, buy only sure things, contrasts that quality with the little review's adventurousness. The connection here between the overlapping concerns of the commercial and cultural markets is reinforced amusingly when Jane Heap immediately follows up by citing an ad from Robinson's department store. Quote, this is how the ad goes. I don't write them like this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, thank God. Um, Robinson's prefer that differentness which is achieved by painstakingly doing things better to that which consists of mere calculated conspicuousness. The dial, then, resembles the stodgy department store, painstakingly but uninterestingly doing things better. As good scholars of modernist magazines, we know how seriously we're supposed to take ads in periodicals. <laughs> but this ad is appropriated, not purchased. And the business world here is the site of slow predictability, of the dull quotidian in contrast to dramatic experimental rupture. Not so much, however, in the April 1915 Little Review, where John Gould Fletcher offers in his essay, Ver Libra and Advertisements, the simultaneously ironic and anxiously defensible claim that ad writers have a better grasp of melopoia than most poets. Negotiating space between the melopoia of advertising and that of modernist poetics as one typical example of the cultural tensions and dialogues that the reader critic staged. In the contemporary poet David Anton's phrase, and in the pages of the Little Review, that is what it means to be our own God. Thank you. Thank you very much for exciting talk. And Happy to take uh, yes. questions, responses. I know some of you probably need to leave for other commitments, so feel free to do so, yeah. There seems like there's a, a tension in your talk between, on the one hand, thinking of these uh, voices in the reader critic as uh, kind of uh, attempts and successful attempts to include the voices of the other, so the, the contrary uh, uh, voices that people are canceling and, and, and whatnot. 
Um, and the idea that this is a cultivated uh, forum uh, that's heavily edited, that, that is kind of, uh, even when it's including those voices, it's able to kind of bracket them and, uh, in a sense, put its own spin, spin on, mm -hmm. on, on them. And so I'm, I'm trying to sort of struggle then with that, with that tension as to sort of where you're, you're coming out. Is it ultimately sort of a, a, cons a doomed conservative project that in, in its ability to you know, include, include those voices with its own spin on it then sort of uh, pulls the, the rug out from, from underneath the, the, the idea of including the other? Or is, mm -hmm. it, is, it, success, is it ultimately successful in doing it? Um. I, th I think you have put your finger very much on a central issue in the talk and in the little review itself. Um, and I'd say a couple of things. Um, I think in the magazine itself, the tension is partly tonal as much as anything. And there's a kind, so there's a kind of toggling back and forth between um, accommodating more, we use the term mainstream, that's it, accommodating more mainstream or conventional or conservative responses um, and taking them seriously, right? which, is, um, which is done in one kind of tone. Um, either the reader intervention will be presented without comment, or um, Margaret Anderson especially, um, will talk back in a way that the level of tone is actually reasonably engaging, right? takes the, the reader's intervention seriously. Um, what happens tonally, but also um, as a matter of the development of the magazine, is that there tends to be a shift kind of coinc coinciding partly with Jane Heap's arrival on the scene, um, who she brought a much higher level of snark to the proceedings <laughs> than Anderson did, um, partly coinciding with Ezra Pound's tenure as foreign editor, um, because I think probably most of us know of Pound's um, tendency to, um, well, to put it politely, look down on <laughs> readers occasionally. So, so one shift that happens um, is a tonal shift towards um, more kind of self-consciously avant-gardist and coterie pushback. Um, but at the same time, and I, I guess this is the last thing I would say in response to the question, um, we have to think in terms of uneven development. So it's not like there's exactly a change so much as the change constitutes um, a kind of tonal addition. <coughs> so even after um, the magazine starts to take a more alienated and alienating stance towards readers, um, you'll still have these little pockets of um, people critical of the magazine being allowed space to register their commentary, you know, without being pissed on. Sorry, sorry to the archive. <laughs> does, does that help? Yeah, 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 Jeff. Um, thanks. That's great. And uh, just to sort of pick up on that, I. Mean, I Maybe I overdetermined the beginning with Ann and right, but what it means to be avant-garde, he's very, very he's on these very same sorts of issues, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of down on Christo, down on this idea of shock as being a guarantor of avant-gardeism. Um, and we're trying to talk about response to these everyday quotidian operations, right? If you can't I forget exactly how it ends, but there's something about somebody in his family who forgot who they were or something. And if you can't respond to that, then you're not avant-garde. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Um, so I mean, is that Am I right to see that's what you're doing in terms of trying to sort of take that former commitment in the little review to shock to something like that and saying, no, 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 it may be a commitment to the, to the process, to the response to the new. Mm -hmm. uh, and the warehousing function of the little magazine may not be as important as this dialogic or response function. And the warehousing is there, and we look back and we see the warehousing, but maybe that's what the dial does, or maybe, 
that's really not their game. That yeah. avant-gardism is just response to the, the you know, response to the new, not the production of it or the shock or all these other sorts of things, mm -hmm. which we tend to hang on to. Which is that? Um, something, something like that. Yeah. Um, the the one way I would tweak that would be this: that um, I don't want to seem to be suggesting the the little review was not as committed to avant-garde work and political radicalism um, as it seems. So, so I don't want to back off on those um, traditional claims for the magazine. But what I'm trying to suggest is the way, one of the ways it promoted um, the work that it wanted to promote and the ideas that it wanted to promote um, was more dialogic and more back and forth. So, um, in conversation with that which it, it was resisting, rather than simply um, taking for what you know, in many decades in you know theories of the avant-garde was the idea that you know. Avant-gardeism is kind of monolithically constituted in relationship to this like, unredeemable philistine other. So I kind of want to complicate that a bit via, as you say, um, attention to um, an immersion in quote, the quotidian process of conversation. Yeah. 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 I have a question about this dialogue and responsiveness as it relates to the content of American political and European events at the time. So we're talking a time in which the First World War is on, we're talking a time in which, you know, Easter 1916 is happening in Ireland, etc. Et and if there's all this um, debate about, about who is situated where and expatriate American poets and so on, I'm wondering how those events do or don't appear um, in that same kind of dialogical way. Um. They mostly don't appear, um, but their non-appearance uh, is addressed within the pages of the magazine. Um, in other words, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of funny, you know, not that World War I should be the object of humor, obviously, but it's, it's rather comical to see the kinds of back and forth um, letters that I've cited here, also, though I didn't touch on this, um, also coming in re in response to how the Little Review treats World War I. Okay, so, so some people write in and say, you're not doing enough about the war. You know, you, you're not including enough material um, related to the war. Um, other people write in and say, thank God your magazine isn't being dominated by the war. The editor's position on this, um, I won't take time to pull out the verbatim quotation from my notes, I have it in there somewhere. But um, the editor's position on this was essentially that the war, from our point of view, the war is just producing a bunch of bad art. And as an art-centered magazine, and yeah, I mean, and one can be shocked by that position, <laughs> certainly one could not agree with it. Um, but that was the editorial position. So, that, so that's why um, we're not really doing much with the war. In fact, I, I mentioned um, what's colloquially termed the blank page issue. Um, this was uh, an issue, I think it was summer of 1916, I can't remember which month. Um, they published a uh, that month's issue had 13 blank pages in it, um, followed by uh, a bunch of Jane Heaps um, cartoons about her lover, Margaret Anderson, um, and an editorial statement that basically says, we're publishing this, es this issue like this because we didn't get any decent work. We didn't get anything <laughs> worth publishing. So come on, people, up your game, right? send us something worth publishing. And this actually wasn't entirely out of the blue, because it had been set up um, in the previous issue 
Um, Anderson had actually threatened to do this. She had written an editorial in which she had said, you know, I'm really frustrated with how the magazine is going. I'm publishing material that I really actually think is second rate just to fill the pages, and I don't want to do that anymore. So lo and behold, next issue <laughs> doesn't fill the pages. So that was one use of the blank page. Where this is going is um, there was another issue that featured um, a couple of blank pages except for it just had a phrase something like in tiny letters the war right, in the top corner um, and Anderson included this editorial comment that said this is our war issue I'm sure we'll be suppressed for it hmm. but what she meant by this is that this is our war issue is these blank pages are basically what we have to say about World War I. And does that connect at all to Yates's subsequent modern verse in which he refuses to publish any of the war poetry from that period? Is that coming from a similar... Um, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Um, and it's a good question partly because this happens at a kind of cusp in the editor's approach to the magazine, where um, they've moved, they started out with a very open, at the time, radical commitment to feminism, um, a very open commitment to Emma Goldman's anarchism. Um, and so for the first few years of the magazine, um, it was more of, a, it was more a magazine of social and political ideas than it subsequently became. So there was a sort of shift in emphasis from the political to the aesthetic. Um, and I think this, what from one point of view can look like a non-response to the war, is actually part of that shift towards the aesthetic. Um, at the same time, as they publish things like um, Wyndham Lewis's Cantleman's Spring Mate, you know, which comes right out of World War I, you know, or some Hemingway material that comes right out of World War One. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the use of journals for the avant-garde to dialogue with itself is still very visible in the middle, middle of the century with the emergence of the new method of poetry uh, in the 60s with journals like Culture or Foreign Year and so forth. And you can even see it to some extent in the 70s with language. But as I walk down the aisles of the AWP exhibit hall, picking up thousands of journals, I, I see very little of that anymore. And um, we can imagine all kinds of reasons. You see little, you see few magazines, or you see a well, lot, lot of magazines. Lo loads of magazines, not much sense of dialogue. Not much of that kind of internal dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of wondering if, in the same way that Democrats and Republicans have removed themselves into their seven spheres, if perhaps this has happened with poets in some way. Sure. Um, there certainly is less of that kind of dialogue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, you know, I wonder, this is kind of speaking off the top of my head, Alder, but I wonder if part of what has happened there is that um, the, 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 the Philistine other, let's say, <laughs> that's, that, that's using rather strong language, but going back to the language of the talk. So the Philistine other to the Little Review, um, over the course of decades, got poetry. <laughs> it got modernism, it got a certain kind, it got a certain version of modernism, which was able to institutionalize itself, you know, nationally and internationally, as we know, at the level of MFA programs, AWP, etc. So I wonder if what has happened is that the, the, the people who wrote into the reader critic <laughs> in Little Review, um, in a sense, like that sensibility, they became poets later on. And, uh, and they became MFA teachers. And they became affiliated with you know, the institution of the AWP. Um, and so there is a, a kind of separation. But you know, that's complicated, as we all know, by the fact that you know, every, 
so many poets teach now, you know, poets of mainstream and non-mainstream, every other persuasion in between, you know, all have MFAs and they all teach in writing programs. So I think that, even though they don't all go to AWP, so <laughs> I think that complicates things a bit too. We had a question back there. I um, was curious about the circulation of the magazine and like the readership, because it seems like for an avant-garde magazine there are a lot of normal people like writing into the magazine mm -hmm. and people who you would not expect to be interested in that. So I was just wondering like what that sort of looked like. Yeah, um, very variable. Um, the Little Review is one of the many modernist magazines um, about which it is hard to pin down uh, circulation numbers um, just because the record keeping in that period, I guess, was much more um, porous <laughs> than it is now. You know, you didn't have like you know digitized lists of subscribers or anything, right? Um, it varied. It probably didn't get higher than maybe two thousand. Um, That'd be a lot today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it might be actually. All right. Um, you'll see some estimates like in the, uh, the famous Frederick Hoffman, um, Ulrich Allen book, the first major book on modernist magazines, they cite something like 3,000. Um, there's no evidence for that that I can see. Um, and within, uh, if you look at correspondence involving the magazine, um, you'll see the figures going back and forth. Um, but Probably a high of 2,000, um, a low of 1,000 or less. Uh, two things, the couple of things that I think that question, very useful question, brings up. Um, on this issue of typicality, okay, I mean, to say that this is a typical letter and we get loads like it okay, is to project a certain like, amount of readers. Right. Okay. So what if, and I don't know how to resolve this question, what if the claim to typicality is fake? <laughs> what if I'm just saying? It's like the Onion's Area Man. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Area right. Man has hair flowing. Like that. Right. Oh, no. Hold, we get hordes of letters right like this. You know, well, did we really get hordes of letters? No, or did we get two? <laughs> um, well, the, letters, so, the letters might not be from subscribers. Well, I've often wondered also how many of the letters are, are hoaxes for themselves. Um, I think one would have to do some pretty deep archival work um, to, uh, to resolve that question. Although, thanks to Google, we can now look up all sorts of improbable sounding names you know, and learn that, yes, this was actually a real person <laughs> who wrote into the magazine. So there's the typicality question. Um, your question also kind of leads into um, the magazine's relationship to commerce, because as part of the the little review was engaged in an endless search for more readers because they were broke all the time. Um, so the fact that they were broke tells us they weren't making enough money off subscriptions and advertising to really um, to sustain the magazine. Um, James Sidley Watson at The Dial, um, the magazine that Little Review so constantly set itself against, um, on a number of occasions gave them money so they could keep going. For instance, um, Rachel Lindsay, whom Ezra Pound makes fun of in that poem, um, gave them money. Uh, at a certain point, they pretty much gave up on advertising. Um, First couple of years, they did reasonably well on advertising. Um, then they started to figure out that basically businesses, corporations, you know, department stores, etc., weren't in the business of like, giving their money to anarchists. <laughs> they were not going to buy advertising space. Um, in fact, there's another another nice use of the visual page in one issue of a little review. Um, kind of piggybacking on the question of blank pages earlier. <clears throat> there's an issue where there's seven pages 
which have little um, kind of blocks by the flow ads in the middle of, of the page, um, where the editors say that you know, business X and business Y and business Z could be advertising in this space, and you're not, how come? <laughs> well, that's like the content of the page. Aaron, <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for that. It's really interesting. Um, but you have mentioned Poetry Magazine and all of this, right. Mm -hmm. right, which is sort of looming. Right? It's in Chicago and it mm -hmm. has a serious readership. Um, I wonder if that could be triangulated with the Dial and the Review as something that really doesn't entertain any kind of a dialogic relationship to its readership. Mm -hmm. and it's deliberately international and in its, um, in its breadth. Is, is it, do, you, do you think that that has any play at all in the way that the little review is reaching out for real or fake um, Yeah, I think it does. Um, and the, to think in terms of triangulating poetry with these other publications um, is a useful idea. Because for one thing, you know, it's a poetry magazine. Right. Um, which the little review and the dial were not. Right. Um, limited to, so there's not serious, right? Ser and serious poetry, um, but they publish big <laughs> batches of Yates. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> right. Um, that, but there's this, uh, yeah, there's a different relationship to audience, right. as we know, mm -hmm. um, with uh, poetry at least thinking of itself as a high-end serious publication, but also democratic mm -hmm. in its commitments. Yeah. Um, in a way that the little review moved away from being, though I would say it started out that way. Um, and uh, a way that, you know, it's something the dial didn't represent either. No. I mean, there was back and forth in the dial, but the dial was kind of almost self-consciously an educated upper middle class kind of publication. And then I think that, you know, there's the nativist versus internationalist difference. You know, and it, it's not obviously that poetry did not publish um, non-American poets because you know, they publish major ones all the time. Right. Yeah, but the, the, the core commitment was to um, Americanness over internationalism, I think, in these early years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, that's why Harriet Monroe and Ezra Pound were constantly arguing right. in correspondence. Anderson started off working for Poetry Magazine, actually, when she moved to Chicago as a young woman, but before she started the little review. And they were in the same building. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's funny to think about. <laughs> okay, anything else? Okay, thank you again. Thank you very much.